Good afternoon and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region CPD webinar on Building Regulations Approved Document O Overheating. My name is Joss Brownlee and I'm the chair for the Sibsey West Midlands Region Committee and it's great to have you with us today and thank you for joining us. Just a few housekeeping elements to start with if I may. Please could you turn off and keep off your cameras and mics for the time being. We're not aware of any fire system testing, so if you do hear an alarm or announcement, please action it accordingly. This seminar is being recorded for visuals and audio and will be made available publicly shortly afterwards. CPD certificates will be sent via email afterwards. Please get in touch if you don't receive it automatically. Please use the chat function to ask any questions and I'll relay them on to the panel. If you could indicate who the questions aimed towards or whether it just in general to the whole panel, I'd appreciate it and it will hopefully get your query answered more accurately. We'll try to save some time towards the end of the hour for open forum questions. Approved document O overheating came into force on the 15th of June 2022. It applies to all new build residential development, care homes and student accommodation. The regulation requires the development of overheating strategies demanding input from specialists. It will change the way we design our dwellings. This roundtable panel discussion comprises a series of reflective sessions bringing together experts in the assessment of overheating in addition to perspectives from ventilation and cooling suppliers and lead designers for property developers. This is the first session and it's intended to provide an overview of the regulations and what those on the panel view as critical points that need to be considered. Further sessions are currently scheduled for December and June next year. Providing expert opinion on the assessment of overheating, we have Susie Diamond and James Healy. Susie co-founded Inkling, a building physics consultancy in 2011. Her core skills are in using dynamic thermal simulation tools to predict the operational energy and thermal performance of buildings. She uses these skills creatively and intelligently to enable more informed design discussions and better buildings. Susie has become an expert in the field of predicting overheating in homes. She was the lead author in SIBSI's TM59 design methodology for the assessment of overheating risk in homes, which is now referenced in approved document O. TM59 being the one page design, design stage tool published in 2019 and supported more recent retrofit version. She is a lead author on the imminent Future Homes Hub Compliance Guide for approved document O and is working with authors on proposals for an updated TM59 for which research is currently being undertaken by Loughborough University. She regularly speaks and writes blogs and articles on the uh, topic of assessing and mitigating overheating risk. Welcome Susie, it's good to have you with us today. Thank you. James Healy is the Acoustics Director at AESG and is an industry specialist in acoustics, ventilation and overheating. James is the principal author of Acoustics, Ventilation and Overheating Guide, which is now referenced in approved document O. James is also part of the same group of principal authors who have this week published guidance on how to produce assessments which are compliant with the regulation and has contributed to the previously mentioned Future Homes Hub compliance guide for approved document O. Hi James, it's good to have you with us today. Hi all, thank you. Providing the perspective of a ventilation and cooling supplier, we have Richard Payne. Richard has been working in sales and marketing roles within the construction industry for the last 19 years, which has given him a comprehensive knowledge and understanding of the supply chain and its intricacies. He has been involved directly in marketing, product management, sales and product development of commercial and industrial fire safety systems and HVAC products, including heat pumps, heat recovery units, electric heating, underfloor heating, and window vents across the European market. Having gained some valuable skills and experience oh, wow. during his time at Honeywell and Dakin, he has now returned to the HVAC market to leverage his knowledge and experience across the whole Volution ventilation brands. Hello, Richard. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. And providing the perspective of a developer. 
we have Sam Potter. Sam is the design director at Reef Group and architecture director at Urban R, Reef's in-house design studio. He has led the he has led the design of some of Reef's most prestigious schemes, including Cavendish Square, Square in London. He oversees the design and management of broad spectrum of complex mixed use projects that deliver transformational impact in a number of UK cities within the healthcare, hospitality, workplace, retail and placemaking sectors. Sam is, an, Sam is an architect with a passion for environmental performance and the creation of innovative public spaces. Welcome Sam, it's good to have you today. Hi, thank you. Excellent. So. Um, Susie, please could you set out the key points of relevance in re re relation to this regulation from your perspective? Well, it's quite a big question. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to cover all of the content of part A, that usually takes me an hour, but um, uh, the key things probably to mention are that this is a essentially a good idea. I think um, overheating in homes has been an issue for a while and TM59 and other methodologies have existed for a while to, to help us with that, but nothing's been mandatory outside of um, uh, refer schemes referred to the GLA or to other uh, planning requirements essentially, but it's not it's not been widespread or consistent that, that anything's been, uh, that all homes have been assessed. So I think essentially it's a good idea um, and falls in line with some of the climate change committee recommendations that came out a while ago now. So it's good that something's been implemented. Um, and we're talking about the approved document O that um, applies across England. And there are uh, slight variances in what's been brought in in Wales and Scotland. So that's worth bearing in mind. Um, but I think we're just going to reserve ourselves to the to the English regs at the moment. Um, we have seen, I mean, we've just come off the back of a fairly nasty heat wave. So I think most of us are conscious of how our homes perform in hot weather, probably more pertinently now than we've been for a while. Um, and and I think we've all probably suffered regardless of how well our homes do, unless we've got air conditioning built in, um, because 40 degree heat is impossible to entirely mitigate. Um, but some homes obviously perform much better than others. Um, and some homes perform so badly that even in quite modest temperatures with, without it being a national heat wave, uh, can still see quite uncomfortable internal conditions. So I think the key thing is to make sure that all homes are built fit for purpose and that aren't going to chronically overheat um, and can passively deal with, the, with um, the weather that's coming our way. And Jay, um, yeah, Susie, keep going. Well, those are the main things. I mean, I think we'll get on to the issues of, I mean, there's a complicated bit of compliance. So there's, it's not as well worded as it might be. So it's actually quite fiddly to apply in practice. Um, and we can get on to some of the nitty gritty of how that works in, and uh, some of the additional requirements around security and noise in particular, I'm sure we'll cover. So yeah, I'll let other people have a go. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you for that, Susie. And, and James, from your point of view, key points yeah. of relevance? Uh, well, pretty much everything Susie said, um, are, they're very relevant and we've all we've all um, um, experienced uh, uh, you know, high temperatures this week as uh, uh, but but <clears throat> I guess the key point that um, uh, key, few points that I'd like to make really around the environmental conditions because any um, any mitigation strategy. So it's one, one thing we, we need to um, design our um, dwellings better so that they uh, the, the, the heat gains are reduced. Um, but at the same time, when we're removing the heat that that, 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 that will occur, it needs to be um, done in a way that it means that the, you can still use the property. Um, and that's the key factor is that there's no point um, designing places for people that um, mean that they can do one thing, but they can't do another. And so you, you end up with this, the, a, 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 an uncomfortable situation anyway. So bearing in mind that we have to think about the comfort of the people that we're, we're, work, we're designing these, these, these places for, um, it's entirely necessary that any, any strategy that's developed needs to um, be usable. And that, that, that extends to uh, to noise and, and, and air quality. So um, we can't very much um, expose people to um, poor levels of air quality at risk of their, their health um, as a, but, but to, to deal with um, you know, overheating. And as Susie said, it, 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 these things occur 
more often and, and it's it's not uncommon for um, a normal summer for people to suffer um, um, for, throughout the summer in some situations. So um, uh, the design um, needs to account for that occurrence um, regularly in, 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 some, in some or many situations. So um, exposure to, to, to air quality is, is, a, is, a, is a health risk if, if unless, a, unless it's thought about. And the same applies to noise really. Um, and, the, and the regulation covers noise at night. So um, uh, we perhaps the biggest health risk for people um, across um, across the Europe, exactly, uh, uh, really, uh, um, is um, is uh, sleep disturbance, and that uh, the the, the knock-on effects from sleep disturbance um, cause uh, serious health effects, um, and that's why noise is an intrinsic factor in any OB strategy to make sure that um, uh, we're not uh, uh, inadvertently placing people into situations where um, uh, the knock-on effect of anything is is causing other problems, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, element of um, comfort is uh, quite a subjective one and, and one person's comfort is not necessarily somebody else's. But uh, yeah, um, Richard, what about you? Uh, key points in, in relation to the regulation from your perspective? Yeah, I think um, this is one regulation um, that we interface with uh, part F and uh, part L for energy. Um, and part o for overheating, so it's a welcome addition to the suite of uh, regulations that we uh, we have to comply with. I think the important part here is that it's always an interaction between all of the standards that we have to we have to meet. Um, they're all here for health. Um, you know, we're passionate um, in our organisation around uh, noise and providing um, adequate ventilation for healthier homes and environments. And I think that. Um, for a long time, the regulations have subordinated ventilation to energy efficiency, which has led us to have an, a more of an overheating problem um, in the properties that have been built. So it's really good from my perspective that um, mechanical ventilation is being flagged in part O as a as a uh, one of the potential solutions um, to to the problem. Um, and that it's got a, a higher weighting now in the rest of the regulations so that we're going to take it take it seriously. But I do think that one of the most important takeaways that I've learned from my time in the industry and what we talk to our customers about is um, there is no one solution here. Um, it will very much depend on the type of property that you have, the location of it, um, security issues, as, as, as James has mentioned, noise issues overnight as well. So there's a number of factors that need to be considered when um, putting a solution in. And a lot of those uh, those factors are, are geographic um, in nature as well. So it gets complicated. Um, I think we've got the products uh, that can help. Um, but I think um, the important thing is it's here and it's being recognised and that mechanical ventilation is is uh, has been put as part of the solution, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, good. And uh, Sam, from a um, developer's perspective, what about yourself? Key points for, of relevance? I, I think the key the key thing is it's welcome. Not not by all of not by all of the development industry certainly. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's similar to the other guys. It, it's a case of how it interrelates with the other compliance requirements and what pressure that puts. But I think the really interesting thing we're seeing, and, and we're in a slightly privileged position of doing some fairly large projects which have involved streets, gates, urban parks, etc., is it it puts pressure on to actually change the external environment um, where you can. So, so balancing some of the things James was touching on, let's change the external acoustic environment, let's improve the air quality so that we can actually have naturally ventilated responses to this, uh, to, to this improvement. And before we had that, we had very limited capability of imposing that on, say, local authorities or, or other private landowners. And, and actually the squeeze, as I often call it, with the the confluence of regulation that particularly this year and, and obviously with the climate emergency is driving is actually forcing what we need, which is better in external environments in cities and not just accepting what's there. And the, the more and more of us are now capable of influencing that. So 
I think it's good. It's another stick to get us to where we must get to very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, James, how have you approached working to the regulation? Yeah. Um, see, yeah, it's it's very interesting. So, um, a lot of people are thinking about this. Um, uh, you know, we've got a building. Okay, we need to think about overheating. How do we how do we solve it? Well, um, actually, the the thread of thought needs to be very 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 at the at first stage of thinking about um, a site is actually uh, how noisy is my site. And, and is it exposed to poor air quality? Because everything after that leads you down a different route. So if it's if it's if it if noise isn't an issue, and if air quality isn't an issue, then you've got you've got great freedoms to to look at the natural solutions and, uh, and opening windows and and everything. And and and, and the strategy can be developed um, with fewer constraints. But where where because we need to have that strategy usable, the first question needs to be, is, is the site in a, no, a noisy or, or poor air quality area? And then everything after that follows. So um, if it is in a noisy area, then you have to think about a solution that doesn't involve opening windows. Um, you know, a, a, a case of a well thought out strategy that actually makes the um, internal environment acceptable for, for people. Um, but that, that that first question is, is, is it in a noisy or Poor air quality area, basically, um, and that's really how I've have been um, approaching it and 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 communicating to people in, in, in across the industry. Really, that, that 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 they can write at the beginning of the process. And Richard, what about from a manufacturer uh, suppliers perspective? How have you approached working to the regulation? Um, I think it would it, it really depends on on the on the project. And um, what we what we do have is a suite of uh, different products. Um, that we are, we can offer to our customers. Um, we recently, um, you know, I'm talking within the last two or three years now, uh, launched um, acoustic purge ventilators. We we um, mainly because of increased ventilation rates that are required to um, either meet the ADF purge requirements um, without uh, openable windows or to deal with overheating uh, issues in, in the summer as well. So it's all about moving more airflow through the properties. And because of that, what we're seeing is, is we're seeing larger units that are being specified um, over and above what the requirements would, would uh, need um, in ADF. So that actually moving more air gives you um, a better ability for nighttime cooling, better ability to remove the pollutants and the excess heat. But with that comes bigger products, it comes bigger ducts, um, it comes with acoustic uh, uh, attenuation, acoustic linings that go around the products, um, mainly because when you move more airflow and the fans are running at a higher speed, you get more noise. And that's what I was saying earlier on about um, managing the different requirements within the regulations is that we've got solutions and products for people to apply to their projects. Um, and it's about making sure that we uh, meet um, and provide all of the relevant guidance to deliver against those regulations. So for me, it's larger units, larger ducting to keep the velocity down, it's acoustic jackets to keep the noise in the system, it's attenuation uh, to stop the noise coming through the through the ducting um, and, and really making people aware of the, uh, the impact that that can have. So it's much, much better to run um, a larger unit at a lower flow rate than it is to run a smaller unit at a higher flow rate because it's, it becomes much, much noisier. So it's a it's a balancing act. And um, the other thing that um, that we that we have to um, that we're talking about is, you know, uh, ventilation to deal with overheating can be ten times the ventilation rate of the property, where purge ventilation in part F is four times the normal flow rates. So actually, um, we we have to do other things, um, and it's it's um, we can't do it on our own in terms of a ventilation solution, we have to be part of a system uh, and the package of measures that are applied to the property in order to uh, deliver the required outcome for that property. And, and that comes in um, solar shading, other, other um, uh, keeping the sun out, keeping the light and the heat out to start with, and then getting rid of the heat once it's in there is where we can really come into, uh, into effect. Yeah, it's a fascinating dilemma whether you, as you say, uh, run the fan at uh, the, the selected flow rate and add an attenuator to the thing, 
or whether you run it at a slightly slower speed for a bigger unit and negate the need for the attenuators and of course the uh, eternal difficulty of sealing void space and, and uh, access and maintenance space as well. Um, Sam, what, anything uh, for, from your perspective, how have you approached the, the regulation? We've uh, we've approached the regulation in the same way we've always we know we've always been designing for overheating for for decades. In truth, um, we just haven't been forced to be compliant, and it is changing the way we're designing and delivering the buildings. Not just that, but overlaying it with Part L obviously um, really pushes us. So the big change that I think we're seeing in house is we're designing much more from the inside out. Um, uh, and we've always designed passively. We've always started with orientation. We've always considered uh, uh, aperture sizing variation around the buildings. But now with the issues surrounding super insulation, air tightness, we're having to work even harder. So we, we kind of we start to look at individual rooms from a point of view of how small can we make the window to still achieve the daylight, the view, the comfort, the human aspects. Um, and uh, and look very hard at whether we can then balance that with opening windows and uh, Richard won't like this but we just desperately try to get rid of anything mechanical if we can uh, and 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 that's all, that's obviously comfort behavioral but also cost driven um and and that's how we go but we're finding at the moment we are just getting snookered um even with fantastic orientation uh, because we're having to make super insulated homes strong air tightness and we're working in cities where the environment sadly has only been going one way so how have we approached it well coming back to the way I talked about the first one is we do all of that and then we look to get rid of traffic and we get look to introduce trees uh, and we've got a project at the moment where we've used this regulatory environment to close a road which had four bus stops on it outside a residential area which has mechanical cooling and we've designed the whole system to be stripped from the building because we think we're three years away from moving all the buses somewhere where there aren't receptors and we'll have a pedestrianized street outside so it's driving placemaking so we're trying to use the regulatory environment as a force for good um, uh, and it gets complex but and, and developers have an obligation to do that where whereas many don't have that that approach because they simply can't make that influence so Again, it's a good thing, but it but it but it's it's snookering the ability to actually meet all the answers and forcing us to change cities externally. By yeah. um, orientation, I'm guessing that's a pure north facing, north south orientation of a building for all of all of the units, I guess. It, it not necessarily. It's it, it's taking every well. It's first off trying to look what the site will allow you to do, and obviously balancing all the receptors. And uh, or, or the or the or the elements that are creating the nuisance, and then it's it, it's facade by facade, aperture size, use, changing the uses around within the residential property to gain the greatest benefit, and that is all the good passive stuff that everyone's been doing for decades. Um, but but even when we get it almost perfect, it still can't work because of the compliance issues, and that's simply to do with the external environment, which leaves us only one option, which is change. And yeah. I fully embrace that, and we have to adapt. Yeah, thank you for that. And and Susie, uh, how have you approached it? That's really interesting what you say, Sam, about um, changing the external environment because that's not usually an option I suggest to clients. But I'm going to start <laughs> because <laughs> noise is such a big one, and uh, we tend to just yeah respond as if it's a, a given rather than push back on whether it can be removed. Um, I think it's quite early days in terms of. Uh, response it's you know the regulations only really just come into force and we're still getting our heads around it we're you know I've obviously done a few projects and I've done quite a lot of research into it but in terms of what the solutions are and what we'll see I mean I know you've planned a couple more of these events going forward so as we reconvene in the future it'll be really interesting to compare notes on on what the practice is like of, of uh, applying this regulation um, I think it's going to change a few things and I think it's going to make single aspect flats a lot harder to build for one. I think um, it's uh, and I think it's going to drive looking at overheating much earlier in the appointment. So I think we're going to see, you know, just because if it turns out that there's an issue and that you're non-compliant to find that that after planning is a, is a massive headache. So 
what's difficult is it's quite a detailed involved calculation to do and it's quite hard to do that at an early design stage but I think we're going to have to learn to be more adept at looking at um, sort of broad brush early doors making educated assumptions where the design isn't fleshed out yet and making conservative assumptions that gives the design a bit of wiggle room so that we can ensure that designs are on track early enough that we can be confident going to planning. So I think that's one yeah. of the big things we'll see. Fairly some fairly fundamental changes, I guess, to to our approach as an industry to to uh, the issue. Um, Richard, have you foresee yeah. any uh, changes as a result of the regulation? Yeah, well, just just I'd just like to just come back if I could um, just to um, Sam's point about uh, removing mechanical systems and, and removing where you can, because absolutely it's the it's the it's the right thing to do if you can. And I think the the, the thing I just touch on there is there is an interaction between all the regulations, as I've said previously, and part L is driving down the um, or driving up the air tightness, whichever way you look at it. And when you get to very, very airtight buildings to look after the precious energy that we put inside of it, um, it's actually forcing us to use continuous mechanical ventilation in all of our properties. So, um, you know, what it's, the point that the point I'd really make is the regulations are pushing us in one direction um, and actually it, it kind of pushes us uh, in, a, in, a, in a less desirable um, way for other regulations like our own. So actually it's it's a it's, it's a balanced approach to, to delivering um, a, a good indoor, in, in, indoor environment for the health and um, you know if we do it right then hopefully we can reduce the amount of mechanical ventilation and mechanical systems that we can put into the to the absolute minimum that, that we need and still have a uh, good functioning performing um, properties um, that people can can live and enjoy uh, in, in 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 the conditions that we're going to be facing into the future so sorry I, I just thought I'd come back to that point so I thought it was valuable to 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 add but, uh, but I'm with you Sam I'm with you we don't want you putting anything in that's not required that's absolutely for sure yeah, verging on passive house, I guess. Uh, yeah, passive house is a is a great example of um, uh, of a of a building um, methodology um, that absolutely mandates um, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. You know, um, the thermal mass insulation um, and the, the the products keep you cool in the in the summer and they they keep you warm in the winter. So, and there's a number of other things that you can that you can do in in that. Um, in that uh, standard as well so you know I think if, if all of these things are applied in the right way then they're actually beneficial but if everything comes together and they're applied in an incorrect fashion then I think that's where some of the problems uh, come come together so you know it, like you said uh, you're Sam you're you're balancing small windows with the human factor of everybody wanting to have a uh, an amazing vista for the uh, for wherever their flat or apartment is it may be in central London and actually we're, things are fighting against one another so you know you don't Big glazing is a is a problem for part O, but it, it's good for for people's uh, uh, well-being, I guess. Yeah, there's a, a fascinating piece on circadian rhythm and and the body's reaction to daylight, um, and I guess re reducing the apertures, as you say, Sam, will uh, have quite a big impact on that. But uh, other than reducing glazing and and uh, apertures, have you, have you do you foresee any other changes, Sam? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, we're working with James a little bit on something which is long term view and it, it, it kind of comes back to hope of changing the, of the changing external environment. And what's really good in a way is we're educate. We work with a lot of big funds and we're educating them on what they need to do with buildings. Their view is they entirely focused. The money is entirely focused on low energy, net zero carbon, low you know, and body carbon driven out, zero running, no offsetting. That that those are the things they want to be able to say to their shareholders. We say to them, we can't say any of that right now because we work in environments in city centres certainly where living is challenging to achieve achieve that. So what we're saying to them is take a long term view. Um, put buildings together that comply now where you've got smoggy, noisy environments um, where you struggle to achieve certain orientations because of limitations of sites. 
but design them so that the buildings can organically be adapted over time and design the buildings for 150, 200 years and work on the basis that we all work together to make an environment where you can open the windows because the noise is acceptable because vehicles have either disappeared or are limited to those which require for the function of city uh, and, and the air is absolutely breathable but design your systems low carbon mechanical systems that can be removed from the building without much disruption at a point 20 30 years whenever it is in, in future where we can all live the utopian dream so it, it it is actually changing the way we design and it is forcing funds to take a much longer view on their assets which is only a good thing because it then helps the embodied carbon point of view that those buildings will last a lot longer than everything we've been ripping down that's only 20 30 years old so wholesale change it's all it, it's driving it's a very exciting time to be in in the building industry is, is the simple truth and fortunately funds and the, the money that really gets behind these things is, is is hungry to learn and understand so they can compete yeah. sorry a little bit too blue sky but but gives you an idea of where we're at yeah no it's all good thank you very much for that james uh, what about you any for any foreseeable changes yeah, well, as Sam said, we're working together on something and, and, and that's a brilliant example um, where uh, it's, it's, it's forward thinking and, it, and it's thinking about things in a bigger picture. And, and, and uh, what, what, um, what, what really is changing, um, uh, and, and, and Sam and Susie have said this, it, it, the perspectives are changing in that we, we do have to think about these things very early on and understand them because they are sculpting um, so particularly noise and air quality for example with this regulation but but just the environment um, the environment and where we're building and, and where we're living is sculpting how we uh, the, the, the design of the buildings that we live in so um, uh, and that that to me makes sense but um, but but it's it's uh, it's changing the perspective of people because they're thinking about these things very a lot earlier on and that's is the thing that I uh, see as the as the change because um, very often in the in the past uh, uh, we've we've in our industry we've tended to be a, a an afterthought. Okay, we've got this we've got this building we want to put it uh, we're going to put it here um it's, it's going to look like this and it's going to you know it have this this layout oh and we have to deal with uh, in, you know these these things um and and, they, and it's an afterthought really to think about um the kind of things like noise uh and air quality and actually it's it, it should be the other way around because it's actually going to drive uh um more efficient more more usable and nicer spaces for everyone so um so yeah that, that's what I see as the uh, as, as the change as a result of these these kind of regulations. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Um, if anybody does have any questions, if they want to pose them in the chat, uh, then uh, I'll I'll ask them on your behalf uh, during this this part of the uh, presentation and, and the seminar. Uh, we have had a question in uh, Sam. I guess this one's for you. Um, rather leading and, and maybe uh, a little bit uh, thought provoking, but are developers ready for the change? Yeah. Uh, some. <laughs> if they, yeah, uh, very few in simple terms, but the answer to the real answer to that question is the quality of the people they collaborate with. Um, that, that's how ready they are. If 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 a, if you're a sophisticated operation and you know your sectors, you know you know particularly resi, student health, etc. You will surround yourself with the, the appropriate professionals. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said I had more than a le low level grasp of the full regulatory environment, which is why I work with people like James because we need to understand everything in that for a bit equally in the manufacturing environment i mean it's true the only way we work is learn to get it many developers work in a silo they think they know best they think their last property really succeeded but they don't bother and go and look at the post occupancy uh, results and they're wrong and therefore they don't bother employing the best people they don't bother actually moving on from people who aren't very good and working with others so it's really our de developers who are ready are those who are prepared to collaborate who are agile and are prepared to say when they've got it wrong last time I, I often say to some of our competitors 
what did you know how many nights did you sleep in the last resident affordable residential block that you uh completed and uh, tell me how comfortable you were and was it too hot too noisy uh, could you even breathe none of them have ever done it um I, i'm pretty committed to doing that to, in some of our residentials i always want to do it in our show flats for instance and check because if we've got it wrong we need to know for next time so the, the answer is they're not there will be disasters over the next few years there'll be lots of non-compliance there'll be lots of derogation sought and corners cut um but it will level out it will stabilize we will all improve uh, and the developers who can't will simply fall by the wayside because they can't actually work together with teams who should um but that isn't to say that they all developers are awful it, it, it just keeps coming back to this point which the only way that we will meet this tightening regulatory environment is to change the environment um and, and we have a duty and a lot of us do have the ability to influence that and as susie said earlier we can you think you can't influence it you really can you can just go at it and start suggesting stuff way way outside of um, your, your particular development and we're, we're finding that that's working so the answer is no, but uh, <laughs> but as ever, it will be and it will evolve. And Richard, what are suppliers doing to react proactively maybe to, to the changes? I think we work very closely with uh, with our developers. Um, we we take projects uh, from them and we design systems and we use everything that we've got in our portfolios to um, give them a solution for the for the challenges that they that they face um, and we see properties in all different um, shapes and sizes from single one-offs all the way through to um, you know large scale high-rise central London apartments so you know and every one of them has got different challenges but the core technologies um, that are used to comply uh, with the regulations are, are predominantly the same um, as I said before we're moving to continuous ventilation and um, we've innovated in that space o over the last you know 20 years we've we've got um mev systems in place we've got decentral mechanical extract ventilation in place for more of a traditional approach we've implemented um you know generations after generations of heat recovery products into the marketplace um with more um, larger units that are coming as i touched on previously um larger ventilation products for, for for greater flows we've concentrated on acoustics and reducing the noise out of the out of the products and we've been really driven hard um, to comply with part l on sap so um, we've got highly efficient heat recovery units with very very low specific fan powers um, specifically to part o we've developed acoustic purge ventilators we've got attenuation uh, in place um, and also for where you can't open windows we've got uh, in highly polluted areas, we've we've developed um, you know induct uh, filtration systems. So we've got um, you know NOx filters, carbon filters, a, a whole range of accessories that can go into the system that can help um, you know uh, pollen filters um, all the way through to low grade filters as well. So you know there's a, there's a range of um, products that we've got to suit people's um, requirements. Um, and as I said, we you know we we're not the only product um, solution and, and we, we're part of a system so we have to look at every project um, differently and I, I too like the uh, uh, the view of changing the external environment because you know we shouldn't be we shouldn't have to put NOx and uh, carbon filters on intakes to ventilation equipment um, you know one of my one of my colleagues uh, challenges us quite regularly on the the term fresh air being used for external air and um, he says it's not fresh and um, whether he, whether i like that or not I, I think you know he's he's absolutely got a point you know there's a limit to what product manufacturers can do but we we are we are raising um you know the quality we are raising the the performance of our products um, and we're doing other things in in different areas as well. You know, we're we're Sam touched on the sustainability element. Um, it's all linked. You know, overheating um, part L and and the drivers towards that is all linked to the climate crisis that we're that we're in. And actually, we're we're making strides within our organisations um, to make sure that we use as much recycled material as possible. Um, and you know, um, 
we've been using um, 100% recycled PVC in our ducting now for for many many years, um, and and that's an absolute absolute fact. And we're moving a lot of our other plastics over to recycled material um, that we're sourcing from the circular economy. So you know it's not just innovative. Um, product development in ventilation. It's how we construct our products, the materials that we use and the services that we provide and the education that we give to um, our development developer uh, colleagues uh, in the marketplace to develop a solution that is fit for their for their development. And we couldn't do it without people like James and Susie as well. You know, we're 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 experts in manufacturing products, but we're not experts in necessarily engineering complete systems and solutions, which which is, you know, to Sam's point, what we all need um, to do collectively. We'll de develop a better solution for the people who use the properties. Um, and our primary concern is the health of people um, inside them and the air that they breathe. You know, we have to make sure that the, um, that environment is uh, is protected for them. So, yeah, and um, we've had a couple of questions in. Uh, so thank you, John and Ellie, for those. I'll, I'll come to those shortly. Uh, but uh, just connected, Richard. Uh, with that is how prepared do you think the supply chain is to deliver products and solutions at volume, both new and in terms of maintenance and repairs? So I, I think um, we're already providing a volume into um, the residential market for um, new build development. Um, I, you know, we're I think there's quite a high proportion of, uh, of properties that are being built already with heat recovery in them. And definitely, if you look at uh, the transition away from a single point traditional intermittent fans to a continuous system, um, that's gaining pace now as well. So, um, you know, we, we're uh, a market leader. We manufacture, uh, you know, tens of thousands uh, of, of, of products that go into um, new build uh, residential properties as well as retrofit properties as well. Um, so the scale from a manufacturing point is absolutely there and we're ready to to scale up and, and we've been meeting that challenge consistently over the last 20 years with the adoption of heat recovery, mechanical ventilation, extract ventilation. Um, in terms of the, the skill sets that are required in the marketplace, I think there, there's some work to do. I think that there's some good installs out, good installers out there. There's people who do it properly. Um, there's people who also um, aren't, aren't as educated as they should be and they do cut corners and as an industry what we've tried to do is educate as many installers as possible as an industry to make sure that um, you know ducting in mechanical systems are installed um, correctly to improve their efficiency reduce the noise levels that they generate and and actually function as 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 they they should do so um i think the answer to that question is it could be better i think we need more skilled people out there applying products in the right way um but we're we're as a product manufacturer we're we're ready and um, we we do um complete installation work through some of the brands in in the uk and we are equipping all of our installers with the the right tools and the knowledge to be able to go in and retrofit um solutions uh, it, it maintain them, repair them, because um, uh, that's that's ultimately really important as well. And I think um, part O deals with new properties, but also we're looking at when we deep retrofit existing stock, we're also looking at um, technology um, that we can retrofit into the properties um, that will help as well, such as decentralised heat recovery ventilation. Um, you know, if you're if in if the properties are cool inside then we can recover the cool as well as uh, keeping the heat out um, and and I think that we've we've all got to keep a bit of an open mind about what the solutions are going to be moving forward into retrofit and and new build properties but I think it's fair to say um, I, I speak on behalf of um, my my organization and um, we've got brands such as Ventaxia Manrose in, in, our, in our group um, but I also speak I, I hope on behalf of the entire ventilation um, market we have um, great great products in the marketplace, not just for, from us, but from our competition as well. Um, and we're all we're all there waiting to um, deliver those products um, uh, in the systems that are required to meet the regulations to help people like Sam working with Susie and, and James as well. Yeah, and, and from uh, the reality, the installation side to the modelling side, Susie, is the modelling industry ready and do they understand how to comply with the reg? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think we're equipped. You know, we, we've got these dynamic familiar modeling tools, TAS, IS, Design Builder, 
and they've all uh, released updates recently that um, uh, meet all the additional little tweaks that is within the approved document if you're following the modeling route. Um, so we've got we've got the tools and we've got the methodology in place. Whether we've got enough modelers is an unknown question yet. We don't it remains to be seen how many projects will go through the simplified method within ADO and how many will go through the TM59 route. And I think we've all kind of realized over the last six months that with the with the noise implications and with um, the challenges of actually meeting the simplified method in, in high risk locations like London. And actually, weirdly, in some of the low risk locations that the, the requirements are even more onerous. It's, it's quite strange, the targets that are set through the simplified method. So I think we're going to see rather more dynamic thermal modelling assessments than we had anticipated a year ago when we knew this regulation was coming. Um, and I, I it's it's hard to know how many modellers there are out there. I mean, I'm, I'm a big part of the industry, but um, yeah, and I've been meaning to reach out to sort of a BIPSA in the building simulation group at SIBSI to sort of find out whether there's discussion going. I haven't heard anything coming out of them about part O and giving advice. I know that SIBSI had a meeting this morning. SIBSI are uh, putting together some training courses. So I think we'll see some training coming out um, around part O and, and possibly around TM59 sort of specifically for part O compliance. And I think we're going to need, I think we're going to need that because we're going to need a lot more modelers and there's a real risk of seeing some quite poor modelling coming out as we, you know, put graduates on the tools and sort of throw the manual at them and, and hope they come out with some good results. And it's it's a bit more complicated than that. And I'm a bit anxious that we're going to see some damage to the modelling reputation as, as poor models get um, pushed through for expedience. And then um, that could be that could be a problem. So yeah, getting 270 degrees rather than 27 or 10 air changes rather than 100 or, or whatever it is. Uh, th those sort of things, but also just yeah, inadvertent as well as um, yeah, it, it's it's they're, they're quite complex tools and it's quite easy to make mistakes. So, and James, from a environmental consultancy uh, perspective, um, and the industry, do do they understand how to comply with the regulation? Uh, well, I've been on a an ed sort of an educating mission for for several years now, and. Um, uh, I think in our industry, this, people are slowly catching up. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there. I mean, the regulation itself um, confuses people, uh, mixes up with between um, free area and equivalent area, and and there's all sorts of things which um, which throw people off. And actually, we we, we published the gu a guidance document uh, just this this yesterday, actually, um, the Institute of Acoustics and the Association of Noise Consultants. Um, and myself, along with some 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 colleagues on the um, on, on the committee, um, uh, pu published the uh, wrote the document and published it, and and, and it's actually um, uh, n a number of pages describing um, what is effectively three paragraphs in the regulation to to um, how to comply with it with the regulation, and even uh, even then, it's asking for things that people are are just not used to um, dealing with. Um, so it will take. A, 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 I'm on a journey, is let's say, to um, to to help people along the way, to to help people understand. And um, people like Susie and myself, we we need to be working so, and so much closer um, in in our industry that uh, um, because they're all intrinsically linked. And and understanding, for example, um, what uh, dynamic thermal modelers need to um, to model their buildings. Uh, and dynamic thermal modelers understanding what acoustic consultants need, for example, for for um, uh, for, for designing uh, mitigation, noise mitigation. That that all is is, is really important and is an, an, an educating mission, really. So, um, I I uh, I think the answer is uh, not yet, no. Uh, but we are on the journey and we are making inroads. Yeah. It's a really good point, actually, because I think that's one of the other skills that modelers are going to need is that ability to give advice on what the results are showing and what the mitigations might be and how best to work with other you know, consultants in order to find that optimum solution. But also be conscious that there are these other criteria on sill heights and reach of win openable windows and that all of that has to be included and factored into the calculation. So it's it's more than just knowing the, the modelling software that you're using. It's it's the context around it and the, the regulation as well. And, and the push pull. 
but yeah, every, everything together. And, and it's a holistic strategy that um, every, everything should go into into the one one strategy, I think, is my, my view. Yeah. And it often takes going around the loop a few times in order yeah. to really to narrow down the right op solution. Yeah. Um, Shammers asked a question, Susie, in terms of thermal modelling, what's the basic difference between TM59 and Parto? OK, they're, they're very similar. It's irritatingly similar because it just frustrates me that ADO needed to change. And um, they haven't given any rationale for why they've made changes to TM59. And it's going to confuse a lot of people that there are now these two methodologies which are, you know, essentially the same, but, but are key differences. So the key ones are around there's some more specifics around how windows open and, and part O requires you to open them slowly from an internal temperature of 22 up to 26 is when they reach their maximum opening. And then in addition, there's a criteria around night bedroom windows and that they should be open all night if it's 23 degrees at 11 p.m. So there's sort of subtle differences to how um, TM59 works. It's pure TM59 as we're learning to call it, but um, original TM59. Uh, the other key one is that um, ADO doesn't allow you to use blinds, internal blinds within the modelling assessment. And that's quite a huge one because historically that's always been a little bit of a last kind of push to get you over the line is, is to add in internal blinds or curtains. And I'm torn on this one because I think on the one hand, yes, that's something that could easily get put up, uh, taken out and replaced by occupants for something that is more to their taste. But I think most of us do have blinds or curtains in our homes, particularly bedrooms. And particularly in recent weather, we were all advised to close our blinds and curtains when it was sunny on the sunny sides of the building. So to, to exclude them from the model, I think is is tough. It is tough and it is going to make um, compliance hard in the tougher parts of the country, particularly London, the southeast, uh, particularly in flats, particularly single aspect, all the sort of higher risk um, areas. I think the, the one thing to mention and, and which may become the new silver bullet, but I've not had enough opportunity to try it out yet, is the modelling tools are now enabling the facility to include ceiling fans. And uh, I think this could be quite a useful thing because obviously that just the breeze generated by a ceiling fan, particularly if you're in a single aspect or a area where it's hard to get the breeze through the windows uh, for acoustic reasons as well. Um, could be a really influential, you know, the perceived temperature comes down by a degree or two. And then the fact that the models can now include that possibility, we may see that more commonly designed in. It's obviously relatively low cost compared to a full comfort cooling system, but can deliver quite a lot of comfort for quite a small amount of energy running costs. So I would like to see, I'd like to say that we're going to see more ceiling fans going into homes in future. Excellent. Um, a multifaceted question from Jack, uh, probably for, for Sam and or Richard. Um, do you see much opportunity to use MEV, mechanical extract ventilation, to mitigate overheating at night in bedrooms? And would it be the same system to meet Part F requirements, either at a different duty or a larger system that can meet both requirements? Richard, maybe? Oh, it's a it's a it's a tough one, right? I I, I think uh, to give a politician's answer, I think it would depend. It would depend on it would depend on a number of a number of factors. Um, you know, and MEV is a fantastic system. Um, we do um, do larger vent, larger capacity units as well. Um, the the housings are typically the same size, but we do have larger fans and impellers in in the in the products to move. Um, uh, a larger volume of air and if you couple that with larger duct sizes then actually you can get quite a, a flow through the system and um, I think I think MEV on its own is going to be quite difficult to deliver um, in in some uh, in some properties I'm being quite careful what I what I say here MEV is not a bad system at all um, but I think also you have to you have to take it in context of the system and if you can keep the heat out in the first place, then actually then you've got more chance of, of delivering um, and getting rid of the heat through the through the MEV systems. And um, I think typically the systems that we see, though, being utilised in properties which have a high overheating um, risk um, typically at high rise flats um, in city centres is uh, mechanical ventilation um, with heat recovery. Um, and they're probably by far the better systems to put in. 
um, because you can um, so that you're supplying and extracting air um, in a controlled in a controlled way um, and you can ramp both of those up whilst not relying on wind, small window vents uh, to to bring the makeup air in so I think my answer is is that it, it really does depend and, and Sam, uh, what about um, trickle vents? Are you, do you think we're more likely to need more inlet vents for makeup air or, or for exhaust? Probably a little bit outside my expertise, to be honest. But in terms of, yeah, yes, we are. We are but it, it, we then those have to have acoustic attenuation in most of the environments, and the air's got to be appropriate. So. Uh, I think the the, the broad the broader remit is is again is just always coming back to if we've done everything passively, how can we change what we're dealing with externally and keep pushing that? I know I sound like a broken record, but it it, it does come back to that. But but it, sort of taking a sort of sideways glance at the the question, the other way, the, what we're finding positive change that's been driven is there's there's, there's sort of an assumption that we have to have mechanical cooling in a lot of um, city centre apartments, we simply can't get away from it with the current external conditions. And what that's driving, or particularly actually outside of the residential sector, is is a requirement for green leases um, in a really positive way. So we're able to get tenants, whether it's a PRS um, provider or a fund, to sign up to green leases, which in essence then allows you to get long term commitments to renewable supplies of energy, which takes the edge off the need for all the mechanical cooling. So the industry is starting to veer off into different approaches so that they can hit their net zero carbon targets and not simply pay lip service to it or or just drive offsetting. They pass that on to the tenancies. So we're drawing up various different green leases for office, residential, life science products um, that, that we're, we're working on. Uh, because a lot of the time we're just falling back and going, we are going to have to drop, use energy to create acceptable internal environments. But if that energy can come from sources as the green as the grid decarbonises that are acceptable, then, then that's where we go. So it's a bit of a sideways answer, but it, it, it's sort of a different change that the regulatory environment is driving in, in terms of commercial approach to, to buildings. I think just, could, I, could I just make a point on that on that as well because I think that there's a there, there's a factor that we haven't spoken about which is um, running costs of of systems as well with mechanical um, cooling systems they, you know they they aren't free to run and they do cost um, the people inside the the properties to to run them so I think that that you know and I think even part O says that it's only as a last resort that you should use. Um, you know, uh, mechanical uh, cooling uh, or active cooling. Um, and I think that that's a, a really important part of, of what we do. There's a lot of people out there who who struggle, um, you know, who are fuel poor perhaps in the winter. Um, you know, they, they're also going to struggle to run air conditioning units and plants and, and other other cooling devices in the in the summer as well. So to Sam's earlier point of removing as much mechanical stuff as possible, it's got it's got to be um, good for people um, on on low incomes who who struggle so that uh, we don't have to rely on mechanical cooling to develop uh, buildings that can be lived in 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 the areas um, like city centres where we where we want to live. Yeah, I'm just uh, it's a fascinating uh, element. I'm just conscious of time and uh, apologies to to everybody for not having the open forum, but. Uh, um, just with us uh, getting on for, for the hour, um, we do have quite a few other questions which uh, I'll circulate to the team um, and we'll try to respond to uh, in isolation of, of today's this evening's uh, event. But uh, uh, with uh, the discussions about um, uh, cooling uh, just mentioned there and uh, the, the hot topic as if you'll pardon the pun with the, the, the weather recently, um, a general final question for all. Uh, with the and thank you, John, for for asking this. With the um, UK temperature provisionally hitting 40.2 degrees, are we past the point of natural ventilation for apartments, and should we just move to air conditioning in city centre locations, as this is where the buyers will want it? I 
I, may, may I refer to my my previous answer. I, I think it's it not only it's not just the wealthy people who live in city centre developments, um, and they're the ones who can afford to run air conditioning units uh, all the time. So I think other solutions have got to be found um, to deliver um, workable solutions in in habitable dwellings in in all locations. Yeah, I mean, Susie, Susie's probably better to answer this uh, um, for, for the point I'm about to make. But 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 because it's 40 outside doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know it, it um, that that changing the way we design um, the buildings and um, uh, can limit the uh, internal heat gains the the, 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 the heat gains for, sorry from from uh, solar or, or otherwise um, and 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 that's the that's the effect that we're trying to solve um, I think so it's yeah no absolutely and I live in quite an old house but it's still when it was 40 degrees outside I live in London uh, two days ago it was still peaking only at the thermostat in our hall read 29 which is still hot and it was very uncomfortable but uh, it wasn't 40 degrees and it was noticeably cooler inside and we've Victorian house thick solid walls high ceilings we kept all the doors and windows closed we closed the, we did all the things that all the news was telling us so it and, and yeah, fundamentally, if we put mechanical cooling in all of our homes, we're only exacerbating the problem. We're using more fossil fuels to generate those and run those and, until everything's renewable. But we're also shoving all that heat back to the outside environment, which is exacerbating the microclimate around. So if you've got big box fats, all of them are spitting their heat out. They're just making it hotter for all their neighbours. So it's not an ideal outcome and actually for most of the year and I know the last two days were exceptional for most of the year it is possible to keep UK homes very comfortable and often quite a lot cooler inside than outside without using comfort cooling so I think we need to reserve it for the places that really need it and not not just fall back on it we, we can do a good job designing you know if we do a good job we shouldn't need it as designers so yeah Anything to add there, Sam? Uh, yeah, ad adaptation is the answer, um, and then hopefully change. And the, the, the just building on those points, I mean, as I keep alluding to, plant trees change the local, the immediate local climate. Um, we see it. We we take on plenty of brownfield sites and uh, and push the urban greening that as far as we possibly can to create some local cooling get rid of the traffic get rid of get rid of those elements um uh, and then also to susie's point just design well you know paint the buildings white simple things like that that reflect the heat keep the heat going down it's you know it sounds crazy but those those elements um from speaking from personal experience and having design buildings in that way make a big difference so the answer is perhaps in the short term, yes, we are going to have to have cooling and it's going to cost money, as Richard says, and it's going to, and it, it, it's, it's unsustainable. The answer in the long term is change what's outside, even if locally uh, and, and adapt. You know, we can't stop the global temperature. I think we're past that point. It's, a, it's local adaptation to, to make places habitable again. Otherwise, no one will live in cities ever again. And there are plenty of cities that do see routinely 40 degrees and don't have routine air conditioning and they use shutters and awnings and all sorts of external shading devices that aren't commonplace in the UK but need to become more commonplace. Yeah, Brisele, solar reflective glazing, U values, G values, yeah, they're, they're all tools at our uh, disposal as, as engineers, as construction professionals. You go anywhere in the Mediterranean, they've all got external shutters. Every single flat has external shutters on it. Yeah, or an siest siestas as well. <laughs> no, I, I um, that. So uh, on that note, uh, I'll draw this evening to a close. Uh, I'm sure everybody that's uh, been listening in and, and contributed to this evening's uh, event will uh, be uh, keen for me to pass on my thanks to James, to Susie, to Richard and to Sam. Um, so yeah, guys, thank you very much uh, for, for this evening. Uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we will be looking to to do a couple more events uh, in uh, November, December time towards the end of the year uh, and in June. So uh, uh, there's there's pl certainly plenty of uh, questions and, and subjects that uh, and avenues that we need to, to find out a little bit more on and that people are, are keen to find out more about. Um, so, uh, yeah, I look forward to, to seeing you all um, at uh, future events. 
Um, but uh, in the short term, thank you all very much for, for coming.